OK, let's start. So far, we've talked about Apache Flink um, or Flink SQL um, without not really going into the topic of time. However, time is, a, is usually a very important, uh, important aspect of uh, stream processing. So there's like lots of lots of uh, different situations when you uh, want to work with time in stream processing. Um, some examples are here. Um, if you'd like to uh, aggregate data based on time, something like compute an average of the last uh, one minute or uh, count how many orders were, rece were uh, received within the last hour. Um, also, enriching streaming data with uh, data from other sources like uh, join my stream with the most recent uh, exchange rate uh, is quite common. Or even if you want to do some kind of pattern matching or uh, rule evaluation, uh, for instance, um, emit an alert if there were three unsuccessful, unsuccessful attempts uh, to log in to my service or whatever within the last five minutes. So uh, all of these uh, examples have um, some some temporal comp component, right? Um, you uh, always kind of like want to uh, bound um, some kind of evaluation or, or compu uh, computation um, in within some so some time range. And uh, for many of these use cases, uh, common types of data is uh, user interactions when you want to. Uh, analyze, for instance, uh, click data uh, from websites or mobile apps, uh, log data coming from applications, machines, uh, transactions, or some kind of sensor. And um, when you want to uh, do that on uh, on uh, dynamic tables, there's a there's a few characteristics that the, these queries typically have. So first of all, the input tables are uh, typically uh, append only. So you basically get a stream of uh, all uh, all events and uh, none of the rows in the, your uh, in the table that you write your queries on are uh, ever updated. Um, the schema of such a table uh, defines some kind of time event. So uh, yesterday we've seen uh, when we talked about this uh, DDL syntax of Apache Flink, we've seen this. Um, uh, small watermark clause that defines uh, um, the uh, event time property um, of, a, of, a, of a table, and you basically need uh, such a such, such a time attribute uh, in your table to in order to be able to uh, write queries uh, that work with time. Um, a query that works with um, with time usually consists of uh, like I call it row at a time operators. Uh, something like a simple filter or projection, basically an operator that um, can can be evaluated by looking at a single row, um, and um, so-called uh, temporal operators uh, such as uh, window aggregations, um, joins that work based on time, or uh, pattern matching that is applied based on you know, some uh, temporal uh, within a temporal uh, or time bound. So all of these operators are like. Like if you look at what uh, people usually build when they work with uh, Flink's data stream API um, or, or some other stream processor API, these are kind of like the traditional stream processing operators, operations, uh, window aggregations, um, window joints, and so on. Um, and then uh, when you basically apply such a query on, a, on, on such an uh, append-only table, then the Output table is also an append-only table, which means that it only uh, emits rows, and every row that is emitted uh, will never be updated. So let's first have a look at um, how you can define uh, time attributes in uh, in Apache Flink. So how is this uh, really done? So in, if if you're like a bit familiar with how Apache Flink works or Flink's data stream API works. Um, in Flink's data stream API, um, when you're using, um, there's two different modes of time. There's event time and processing time. Um, event time um, is defined by uh, basically each record is being processed based on a timestamp time that is uh, part of the data. 
So the uh, record itself uh, tells the system, hey, uh, my record is, uh, uh, or, or this event happened at this point in time. So um, you can process the data really based on some, some, some actual data. This is, uh, this is uh, called event time. And uh, processing time is a mode where uh, data is being processed based on the time uh, of the machine um, when the record is processed. So uh, you can think of it having a stream of data, uh, and then an event enters the uh, stream processing application. And if you then want to group data on time, um, based, for instance, uh, grouping data on 10 minutes, then the machine that processes the data will say, OK, what time is it now? It's, let's say, 12 o'clock. And then if you group by 10 minutes, then after 10 minutes, uh, based on the uh, machine time of the processing machine, it will close the window and perform the computation. Um, so there's these different types of uh, time in, uh, in Apache Flink, event time and processing time, and both can be handled with uh, Flink SQL. Um, in order to, to, to um, give access to time in a query, um, a timestamp needs to be needs to be part of the table schema, and um, these timestamps are of the regular SQL timestamp type. So they're pretty much just uh, um, it's a it's a like subtype or extends the SQL timestamp type, but they behave exactly like uh, like you can do with these uh, timestamps whatever you can also do with a SQL timestamp. And um, as we seen before, these time attributes are declared with the table schema. So how does it look for, for event time? So uh, for event time, um, you basically have to define um, a timestamp um, as part of the table schema. Here we call it click time, and it's of type timestamp three. And this is an actual uh, uh, a field that is provided by the, uh, that is really a part of the data. So the, um, if this is a table backed by, for instance, by Apache Kafka uh, with the JSON uh, format, then the uh, JSON records that we read from Apache uh, Kafka uh, should have these this uh, C time attribute with an extra timestamp. So it's uh, it's actual data that is provided by the data. Um, and uh, in addition to this timestamp field, uh, we need to define uh, some kind of watermark. A watermark. Um, watermarks are in Flink uh, meta records that are generated based on the timestamps that are being observed. So you see here that we define a watermark for this uh, event time attribute uh, C time, and we define it as C time uh, minus two minutes. So what this basically means is that the uh, watermark that the system sees. Um, is always um, the uh, highest uh, CETA attribute that was seen by the system uh, minus two minutes. So um, if the CETA attribute um, uh, is, um, is ascending in time, um, then also the watermark will, will, will ascend, but it's always two minutes behind the maximum time. And we do this, uh, we basically uh, subtract these two minutes uh, in order to be able to account for records that arrive out of order, so Flink uh, is a distributed system, and most of the uh, uh, most of the systems that, that we read data from are also uh, distributed systems. So it's really hard to guarantee order in these uh, in these uh, uh, systems. Also, um, also there's the, the the case that even the data that is written to Apache Kafka might already be out of order. So it's really rare that you can work with data that, ha that has a really exact time order. So uh, the watermark here is a mechanism to basically to, um, um, to account for this out of orderness. Or in this case, in this definition here, we basically give uh, the uh, C time attribute um, like a two, two minute margin to uh, be out of order. And um, the operators that Flink uses internally, these time-based operators for window aggregations and so on, um, they basically look at the watermark records that are being generated, automatically generated. And based on the watermark, they determine 
what's, uh, what the current time is. And based on this time, they perform their uh, the computation and also reason about data completeness. So for instance, when uh, there is a computation that should be performed at 12 o'clock, then um, uh, an operator will wait for the water for a watermark that is at least um, what did I say? And there's a computation that should be performed at 12 o'clock, and the operator will wait for a watermark that is at least 12 o'clock. So before the watermark hasn't reached 12 o'clock, the operator will, will not perform the computation, but once the watermark um, uh, is at 12 o'clock or later, then it knows basically that it has seen all the data um, up to 12 o'clock and then performs the computation. So um, depending on how you how you choose this this interval here, um, this uh, this margin, um, you can basically tune um, tune the completeness versus the latency of your results. If you uh, um, subtract like a large interval from the from the click and attribute, let's say you uh, subtract uh, one hour, then uh, a computation will all kind of like be performed um, one hour after um, the highest uh, the uh, click time with the highest uh, attribute was uh, highest value was seen. So you get the result probably much later. But since you have a very very large la a margin to wait for late data, uh, you can also be sure that the result is is uh, uh, is quite complete. If you make, make the margin very small, like let's say uh, only uh, five seconds, then you get um, the result uh, very soon after the after the click time attribute passed the uh, passed the computation boundary. But it might be that some of the data, um, the data that was late, is not really part of the computation. Um, for processing time, um, the attribute uh, is defined a little bit differently. So here, basically, um, a processing time attribute is virtual. It doesn't hold any data. So um, instead, uh, when the query accesses this attribute, it um, basically looks up the current uh, local time of the of the machine that is processing this attribute, that is performing this uh, uh, evaluation of the attribute. So uh, in this case, if there is, uh, if we would have this uh, clicks table uh, defined based on a Kafka topic, then the uh, the records that we ingest from Kafka would not have the click time attribute, but it would just be added as a kind of like virtual attribute that is uh, basically um, uh, evaluated whenever it has been accessed. Um, at the same time, you can also use this click time attribute just as a regular uh, timestamp, but whenever you access it, basically it uh, will just query the local time uh, of the machine, and then uh, and hence it's not uh, not really uh, a deterministic value that you get back. Um, so basically, once you define these time attributes, you can uh, use them kind of like interchangeably. So uh, later on, it doesn't really matter whether uh, time. Uh, uh, um, time attribute is an event time attribute or a processing time attribute. Whatever you can do with an event time attribute, you can also do with a processing time attribute. However, uh, of course, the semantics of uh, are a bit different. Whereas in event time, you use the actual time and the actual timestamp uh, that is coming with the data, and hence is very kind of like precise and exact. Um, if you define the time attribute as a processing time attribute, then it's um, not, uh, not not really deterministic uh, what what you get because it's really based on the on the time when the record is being processed. Okay, um, let's um, talk about temporal operators, basically operators that uh, work on time. So, what all of these operators kind of like have in common is that they um, process records by or associating uh, different records uh, based on some temporal condition. So for instance, um, you can do a group by window aggregation, which is uh, grouping data based on a, a time window. Uh, you collect 
all records that are fall in the same uh, in the same time window. For instance, if you compute hourly windows, then uh, a group by um, uh, group by with an hourly window will uh, aggregate all records that uh, are um, have a have a uh, event have a timestamp from uh, 12 to 1. Uh, all those fall into a group. All records that are from 1 to 2 fall into another group. From 2 to 3 is the next group, and so on. So basically, um, this is a group by window aggregation. A over window aggregation uses the uh, uh, SQL over, uh, over clause. Uh, we'll have a look about that, uh, how, how it behaves uh, a bit later. Uh, in this case, um, the data needs to be or the, the over clause needs to, uh, needs to be defined such that the data is ordered on time. There's a time window join, uh, which joins uh, two streams um, based on a condition where one record is not, uh, not further apart than a certain time boundary uh, in the other stream. There is uh, a join uh, with a so-called temporal table, which uh, is a join that looks up you have, a, you have a stream of records, and uh, for every record, you do a lookup into another table uh, based on the uh, based on the timestamp of the of the record, and you want to get the most recent version of the other table. The other table is changing uh, over time. You can get the most recent version that was uh, uh, valid uh, for 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 the time of this record was being uh, produced. And also, the pattern matching is high, also follows temporal conditions. Um, what these operators basically do, they track uh, the progress in time to decide when input is uh, complete. So if your attribute is an event time attribute, then the operators uh, track time by uh, looking at the uh, event time uh, at, at the watermarks. So um, when you have an event time operation and you want to perform a computation at 12 o'clock, then the operator will do that when the uh, uh, when a watermark is received that is uh, past twelve o'clock. Um, if you are uh, doing a computation based on processing time uh, that should happen at twelve o'clock, then the operator will basically look at its uh, uh, local clock, and when the, once the local clock is past twelve o'clock, um, then the computation will be will be performed. Um, since the operators can really track the progress and make a decision when the input is complete, they can uh, emit final result rows, so uh, results that never have to be updated again. Um, and this is a very nice property because uh, um, dealing with updates in your downstream uh, tasks or systems is always a, always a hassle if you uh, have a have a way to determine that a computation is complete uh, based on time. That's a that's a very uh, convenient feature. Um, but it's not only uh, it's not only the um, a nice property uh, that you can uh, emit final results. The other property is that these operators can also automatically clean up their state because once they produce the final result, a result that they never need to update again. They can also remove all the state that was associated with this result, uh, or that was needed to compute this result. As soon as the operator knows that some uh, some state is not being not never being used again, it can automatically clean up the state, and hence you don't have this uh, situation where uh, state accumulates over a, a larger time uh, uh, over. Uh, over the, over the time that the queue is running, but instead, when you have uh, can you define your computation in a way that um, the query um, defines a temporal bounds on the operators, then um, the the operators that process the data uh, know when they can uh, remove the state, uh, and hence the query can pretty much run forever. Um, in order to make this work. Uh, the temporal operators kind of like need to uh, need a reference to the time attribute that we specified in the uh, in the table uh, in, in the DDL clause. So all of these temporal operators uh, somewhere in their uh, 
when you define the query, you need to reference the time attribute. And this uh, works just with a uh, regular SQL syntax. And we'll uh, see some examples how this works uh, based on temporal aggregation. So um, Flink supports two different types of temporal aggregations. Um, I've briefly talked about this before. Uh, these are the group by window aggregation and the over window aggregations. And uh, we'll talk about both of these different types of aggregations um, now and just use this very simple example table. And we assume that uh, C type here is an um, event time attribute. Although, as I said, it doesn't really matter, it could also be processing time attribute. OK, so let's say um, we want to compute uh, the number of clicks per hour and user. Uh, then this basically would translate to a group by uh, or to a query that uses a group by window aggregation like this. Um, we um, have a query that uh, just reads uh, from clicks. Um, then we have a group by clause. We uh, put the user into the group by clause because we want to compute the clicks per user but also per hour. So, and therefore we add this uh, function call here called tumble. Um, tumble is a function that you, you can think of it um, as a function that um, generates um, a window ID. Um, and we provide here the click time attribute. This is the time attribute. Um, and we uh, end a uh, time interval of one, uh, of one hour. And um, this will now uh, basically perform, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the data will be grouped into, uh, into, into, into groups based on uh, user and for every user in, in a window um, of one hour. So we have a, have an, uh, a group for um, the time from uh, 12 to one, from one to two, from two to three, and so on. And the windows by default are kind of like aligned to, um, uh, are aligned to uh, the, the epoch time, which is like the um, first of January, uh, or uh, midnight at uh, of first of January, uh, 1970, basically like the Unix uh, timestamp uh, zero. So, um, so we group the data here, and then in the select clause, we just say uh, we want to have the user, we want to have a count, and there is this function tumble end, which uh, returns the timestamp end timestamp of the of the window. So for the window from twelve to one, uh, tumble end function would return uh, one o'clock. For the window from uh, one to two, it would return uh, two, and so on. There's also a tumble start function that um, returns the, the start of the uh, start time of the window. And you see here we have, uh, we referenced the click time attribute twice um, in the tumble function here and here. Um, and uh, when you define the query, you actually need to specify the, uh, um, this part here exactly the same in the select clause as in the, in the group by clause, otherwise you would get an, uh, an error. So how would this query be, uh, be executed now? So let's say we have this clicks table here and the query is uh, already running. Uh, we get some data. Um, the data would be uh, basically grouped by the hour. And uh, for, the, for, the, for the first hour, it would uh, produce some, 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 some result. For the next hour, we would also get some result. Uh, and for the uh, uh, third hour, then, then again. And as you can see, the query always appends the result, uh, the result rows to the to the table whenever um, the computation can be uh, can be performed. And you see here we have the timestamps here that kind of fallen through the window range from uh, twelve o'clock to one o'clock, and the tumble end function here uh, returns the uh, end timestamp of the window um, here uh, at one o'clock. There is not only the uh, tumble function uh, to, uh, that you can use to group data on, 
Uh, there's also two other functions. So Tumblr basically looks like this. If you have a uh, Tumblr function of t here is a time attribute of interval two hours, it will have a non-overlapping uh, or slice the slice time to non-overlapping windows of two hours. If you use uh, the so-called hop window, you uh, specify two intervals. One interval, the first interval is the size of the window, and the second interval is the uh, um, step size in which the windows are shifted. So if, for instance, here, if we have a window size of two hours and a, a step size of one hour, then uh, every hour a new window is being started, um, which then lasts for two hours. This also means that um, all records are always being assigned to two windows. So since these windows are overlapping, so this record is part of uh, part of this window, but also part of this window, and so on. And that's basically how we can have overlapping windows. And this can be used for some kind of like a, um, sliding uh, slice, sliding smoothing, for instance. Um, and then there is also the session window. Sorry. There's a question mm -hmm. in the chat. Oh, okay. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, so, um, the yeah. So the, the this is a good question. So there is basically um, so the question. I suppose you can all see the question. But uh, the question is, if the window is from 12 to uh, from 12 to 1, shouldn't uh, the uh, record from uh, 12 o'clock also be in the uh, earlier window? So in fact, I, I was a little bit imprecise. So the end range is exclusive. So everything, if you have the if in the, in the tumble function, so uh, a window from 12 o'clock, a tumble window that is one hour. Uh, would start at 12 o'clock and would close just before one o'clock. So 12 o'clock, 95, 95, 999 would be included in the window, but uh, uh, 13 o'clock would not be. So it's uh, the end timestamp here is basically the um, not not part uh, a record with uh, that had a timestamp of um, of one o'clock would not be part of this window, but be part of the next window. Uh, there is um, not only the uh, tumble start and tumble end function, there's also the so-called tumble road time function. And this function uh, returns a valid uh, event, uh, a valid times, uh, time attribute again. So another uh, an attribute on which you can uh, do uh, next uh, follow up time operations. And uh, this is exactly uh, the end of the of the window. So uh, again, for instance, um, maybe I guess that was a little bit confusing. Um, so if we have a tumble window of I'm just chatting, right writing something in the chat now. If I have this window, then um, tumble start for the window from uh, uh, 12 to 1, tumble start would be, would return this, tumble uh, end would return this, and tumble Road time would return um, this, and uh, tumble road time is uh, tumble start and tumble end are just regular timestamps. They cannot cannot be used for uh, further time operations. Um, the reason for that is that they're not. Uh, really aligned with the with the watermarks generated by the system anymore. Uh, whereas uh, tumble road time is still 
um, aligned with the uh, with the watermarks that the query uh, uh, processes, and therefore you could perform, for instance, uh, another group by operation based on uh, based on the attribute that you get from uh, Tumblr row time. Okay, um, so in addition to the uh, Tumblr and top windows, there's also the uh, so-called session window, where you are again uh, provide a time attribute uh, and then an interval, but this interval is, does not uh, specify the size of the window, but uh, rather it specifies the size of a gap. So uh, basically the data is then uh, grouped based on gaps of inactivity, inactivity here, um, means not seeing a record within this uh, time range. So um, if we have uh, a session window of 30 minutes, you find we would get here for this data here, uh, one session uh, with these uh, five records, then we would have a gap that is larger than 30 minutes. Um, hence, after 30 minutes, this window would be closed. And then uh, as soon as the next record is received, uh, and the new window is uh, a new uh, session window is started, and data is added as long as there's no gap of 30 minutes of uh, uh, at least 30 minutes. And uh, once we, we find a gap of these 30 minutes, this window is again closed. The computation is performed, and when the next record is received, a new window is opened. Um, so these group by uh, group by window aggregations is uh, like once one way how you can group data based on uh, time. The other one is this so-called over window aggregation. Let me quickly check. Um, let's see. Okay. No idea how this works. Um, anyway, um, do you know how the uh, I oh, I know I closed the chat. Um, are you aware how uh, SQL over windows work, or should I uh, go into that a bit? I think it's not a okay. Yeah, so it's a rather it's I think it's been part of the. Uh, SQL standard for, for, for quite some time, but it's not used very often. Uh, however, I think in the in the context of streaming, it's actually a very nice uh, nice way to uh, nice nice feature you can uh, work with streaming data. So, um, so one example of what you can do with these over windows is um, imagine we have this uh, clicks clicks table, uh, which gets a new record for every click that a user is doing. So let's say we want to compute for every click that was done, how often this URL was clicked uh, in the last, in the previous two hours. So we kind of like need to perform computation for every input row. We're not uh, reducing the data, but we want based on a, on a single row, we want to look two hours back in time and count how often the, uh, uh, the row was clicked. And for this, there is, uh, this uh, SQL syntax, uh, again, this is standard SQL syntax. It's nothing that we invented. And um, here you can define uh, a so-called window. Uh, window, you give it an alias. Uh, here we give it the alias a W. And uh, then uh, the window is defined uh, based on these three clauses. The first one is a, a partition by clause. Uh, here we partition by URL because uh, we kind of like want to perform or want to group, uh, perform a computation and aggregation based on the URL. Or, so we want to know how often each individual, U each URL was, was clicked. So we partition by URL. Uh, we have to give an order by clause, order uh, condition here. And we, here in the order by clause, we put the uh, K 
click time. So here again, this is the, the, the point where we have to tell, uh, tell the system, here we want to perform this operation based on, uh, based on our time attribute that the table provides. And then you can uh, perform a range uh, that is basically, that depends on how the data is ordered. And um, the partition basically tells which data is included into, the, uh, into this partition. And um, um, here we define the range as between interval two hours preceding and the current row. So uh, when you can, when you when you think of a of a row, it will uh, uh, perform a computation here, and we basically say we want to perform a count aggregation over this window. Then when we uh, uh, when the system processes um, a, a click coming from clicks, it will. Um, look what's the URL for this click. Uh, it will look what are all the other URLs uh, um, that I've, uh, how often was this URL uh, clicked within the last two hours? Um, and uh, the data within these last two hours is ordered by, by, this, uh, by, the, by the time attribute. I have a little example here. Let's uh, let's hope that this uh, makes it a bit, uh, a bit clear. So here we say uh, count over order by t. So we I left the partition part back um, out here because it just it just complicate things. But let's just focus on on the order by clause and then the range part. Um, and um, if we now get some data, yeah, we get a single record here. Uh, we get the record. We have to look two hours back, um, and let's say there was no data for this. Um, this is the first record that we see, and then the count aggregation will return one for this record. So we get the next record. Um, from this record, we look again two hours back, and we see, hey, there was a record, and it's exactly this record. Hence, the count for this is, uh, is two. We get the next record. Here again, all the three records still fall into this window. Um, the count is three. We get the next record. These two are not no longer part of the uh, are more than two hours apart from this new record here. That's why they're not part of the computation. So the uh, the, the count aggregation here returns two, um, another two, three. And four, and you can do pretty much every any uh, aggregation function here can be uh, can be evaluated over such a such a window. You get also uh, some values of uh, some some values of records that are within these two hours, or you can uh, compute min, max, average, and so on. Um, yeah, so this is a fairly uh, a fairly convenient uh, or, or powerful syntax for doing lots of uh, lots of uh, interesting things over over streams that are like naturally ordered by time. Let me quickly check if there's um, was that clear how it works? Oh yes, yes please. Um, the order by um, argument that's basically to indicate what the range should look at right it doesn't order anything by itself um yes um so you could also also think of if you have an aggregation function that would something like return the last or the first value of a group um then the uh, order matters um the system here does not really um uh doesn't really order the data necessarily, it would basically, uh, um, it's really needed. So like from, from uh, SQL's point of view, uh, SQL does not uh, work on uh, order data, right? It always works on, uh, on, 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 on sets of data. Uh, so we kind of like need to uh, explicitly tell, uh, tell, tell any database that wants to evaluate an over window uh, what, how should the data be be, be ordered? So in uh, plain SQL, uh, this also works on 
basically on honor any any audit attributes, so not only on time. So you could also, like in a, in a regular database, you could uh, have an over window that just orders some uh, some numeric values and then uh, performs the computation here. Um, in our context here, we only support these over windows if you uh, order on time. And that's uh, pretty much because we kind of like work on uh, evolving data and uh, it only works if we assume the data is already ordered, which is the case uh, if we order on time. Um, if we would have to order on anything else, uh, we could never really finish the order because we would have to wait for more data to see. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's one more thing with uh, respect to time attributes. That is like uh, I said, these are basically regular timestamps, but they have this uh, special property that Flink basically knows that these timestamps are um, kind of like ascending um, and uh, ordered with a little bit, or possibly with a little bit of order of orderness, but uh, for that, we have the watermarks. So um, it might happen, or depending on what you do, how, you, how you use these time attributes, it might happen that an event time attribute is uh, converted, or basically, yeah, is, is being basically converted into a just regular timestamp. It cannot be used um, as a time attribute. So uh, for instance, when you have a regular timestamp, you could not, you cannot use a regular timestamp here in this order by clause because um, Flink would not know that this is a, this times timestamp is uh, is ascending and could not uh, evaluate this uh, uh, or perform this computation properly. So it really needs to be um, an attribute uh, that is an uh, is an uh, proper time attribute, uh, which means Flink knows it's ascending. If it's just a timestamp, any any kind of timestamp, you can also have uh, tables with whatever timestamps you want. Uh, but um, in that case, Flink lacks the knowledge uh, that it's uh, ascending and cannot really perform the computation. And it could happen that uh, you have a time attribute and that it kind of like loses this uh, time property. So uh, when this happens, um, yeah, as I said, uh, the event time attribute becomes just a regular timestamp and it cannot be used in these uh, temporal operations anymore. And this happens, for instance, uh, once you try to modify the time attribute. For instance, if you do something like a uh, like this uh, flow operation, if you flow the timestamp to a minute, um, then uh, the, the result of this will not be an uh, event time attribute anymore, but it would just be a regular timestamp. Uh, we do that for any kind of computation here, so there's also ways that you uh, that you could, for instance, just uh, uh, just add a constant to the time, and then you would say, yeah, okay, it's still. If I add one minute to every timestamp, it is still ordered. But um, we didn't make the system smart enough to really figure out what's the semantics of a of an expression that you apply on a on a timestamp. So uh, whenever you use such a timestamp in an expression, uh, the result is just a regular timestamp. It's not an uh, not an event time attribute. So that's uh, one one way basically to um, lose the, the the time property, and uh, the other one, if you use it in an operator that does not preserve the uh, order uh, in 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 their output. So um, there's, uh, for instance, uh, some uh, some example here would be. Um, if you use a non-windowed aggregation and you put the click timestamp into the group by clause, uh, then you you can do that. Uh, you would basically uh, group on the uh, on the click time here, but um, the output of this group by operator operator uh, would uh, first of all would uh, be updated whenever there's a new record coming from clicks, um, and it would not be in the uh, in the timestamp order anymore. So the output of this query would uh, the, the output of the query uh, 
uh, would not be ordered on click time anymore. And hence, um, the system has to convert it down into a, a regular time step attribute. And the same also holds for joints that don't have a temporal condition. Um, we will talk about that later uh, in detail, but um, you can think of this as you have a have a table of with some data, some records here um, that let's say that arrived. You started the query one hour ago, and you now have the data of one hour here. Uh, if now a record comes from for, for for the other table, it can join with any record in the table. So uh, it could join with the first record, and then you have to forward the timestamp of the first record. Then another record comes and joins with the with the last one. So uh, you have to forward the record of the last one, and then another one comes and joins again with the first one. So the order of the timestamp of the of the result is absolutely out of order, and um, hence we cannot really use it as a as a time attribute anymore. Um, for processing time attributes, uh, this, the the situation is a little bit easier because uh, there we always uh, just uh, query the time from the from the system. So here we just use the uh, uh, use the condition when uh, the processing time attribute is modified, then it also becomes just a regular timestamp and it's not a uh, not a not a time attribute anymore. So um, yeah, to summarize, many of the traditional streaming uh, stream processing operations can be can be done with a SQL as well. Um, and um, Flink provides uh, temporal operators um, for that to do that efficiently and with uh, uh, small uh, small state sizes. Um, the input of these input and output of these queries have to be append only tables, or the input have to have to be append-only tables, and the output then automatically are append-only tables. Um, these queries should only use like, these record at a time operators, like uh, uh, filters, uh, the where clause or the select clause, uh, or these special time uh, temporal operators. Um, time attributes are defined in the table schema in the DDL. Um, you can define event time and or process time attributes. You can actually also define tables that have both. Um, and then when the query is actually being processed, these uh, temporal operators process the data based on these time attributes. Um, and um, the output is always final results. That's also why the output is only and only tables. And these operators also automatically clean up the state when uh, as, as time moves forward. Okay, then let's have a look at some of the exercises. Um, I would say, uh, um, I give you again uh, a few minutes that you can uh, play with the with the uh, with the system. So um, it's here, um, number three, queries and time. And there's a, a few exercises for these, one for a group by window aggregation and one for an over window aggregation. Um, yeah, just let's say at um, 7.30 we continue. You can just um, yeah see how far you get. If you have any questions, uh, yeah, let me know. And then we can discuss uh, the solution afterwards. All right, let's have a look at the exercise. So um, the um, task here was to um, count the number of arriving and departing rights per area uh, in minutes of five, in windows of five minutes. So the, um, and we're only interested in events that start and end in New York City that start or end in New York City and areas with at least uh, five arriving and departing rights. So this is the uh, 
take the query here. That's the, uh, the, the result. So we are um, reading from the rights table. We filter um, on the, uh, we're using this uh, user different function is in New York City. And then we group um, on the area ID because we want to, um, want to count per area. We also want to uh, distinguish between starting and ending uh, uh, right, so that's why we put this uh, Boolean variable, this start here, into the group by clause as well. And then we define the tumble, tumble window of five minutes. Um, and finally, in the select clause, uh, we kind of like repeat all of these things here, uh, putting the tumble end function here instead of tumble and uh, doing the count aggregation. So if we paste this query here and um, Run it, then, yeah, there we go. Um, so this is the area ID. This is uh, uh, for a starting right, and this is for an ending right. And um, here's the count. And um, since we have the uh, a window of size uh, of five minutes, um, we now, uh, and we're basically feeding data at uh, the speed of 10x um, into the system. We are um, seeing new events. Wait a second. Uh, five minutes are 300 seconds. So every, every 30 seconds, uh, the system can complete uh, a new window aggregation every 30 seconds. Therefore, uh, we see uh, new data arriving here. So and that's uh, also kind of like an indication that the, uh, that we are working with uh, live data here. So that data is fed into the Kafka topic. It is uh, the, the query reads it out of the Kafka topic, but it waits until it has seen enough data to then um, uh, finalize the computation and produce a result. Uh, for the last uh, five minutes in event time. Um, this is also a good um, good indication that we are working with event time here. If you would uh, use processing time um, and we would perform this, uh, or if we would run this query on a, on a, a process time attribute, if write time here was specified as a, as a process time attribute, uh, then the system would actually uh, always wait five minutes because the five minutes then based on the um, based on the machine time of my computer. So, um, uh, but since we're using event time here, there's also this possibility basically to um, speed up speed up uh, processing. Um, it has also the nice property, for instance, that if we uh, would uh, read data from uh, if you're reading data uh, from the from a Kafka topic that has already some data in there, uh, all the data gets properly uh, uh, properly assigned to the right windows because we're working with the real data. If this was like a um, was a processing time timestamp, we would uh, uh, basically add as much data as we can within five minutes, uh, not or looking at any of any any timestamp. Um, for the over window, over over window aggregation query, here the task is to um, basically for every uh, for every uh, departing uh, for every right start event, uh, we want to uh, see um, we want to compute um, um, for for every we, the task here is to, to basically identify areas uh, uh, from which more than 10 people left by a taxi in the last 10 minutes. Um, so for that, um, we, sh we want to uh, emit a new event for every, uh, a, new, a new row for every um, uh, right departing event uh, where this condition basically is, uh, is fulfilled. Um, and the query looks like this. It is a nested query in this case. So let's first have a look at this. Uh, at the at the inner query here, 
Um, we, um, it's actually three times nested here. Um, so uh, the first query here is a simple selection and projection. So we uh, read from rights and um, filter only on, on the start events because we're only interested in start events. And then we do this projection here, computing the area ID um, and select the right time and the passenger car because those are the fields that we need for the, uh, for the later computation. So this is, uh, after this one, we only have the start events and uh, did some pre-calculations here for the area ID. Um, then we de define a window here, yeah, uh, again, alias uh, W. We partition on the area ID because um, we basically want to perform this computation in the context of the area ID. Um, order on the right time, and then uh, basically on a, on a range of the, of the current row, and all rows in the range that were, uh, were being uh, received 10 minutes uh, before the current row. Um, yeah, and this range here exactly is based on based on this right time uh, attribute here. So what do we do with this uh, window? So we use it to, in this uh, sum computation, where we basically sum the passenger count over the last, uh, over this, uh, uh, over this window. And then we have uh, the area ID. We have the right time of the, uh, this is the timestamp of the, um, of, of the, of the row that we're currently processing. Uh, and then the sum of all the passengers that were within this area um, uh, 10 minutes before before this uh, right start event. So this is this query. And then since we're only interested in uh, in areas where this people count, or this uh, people leaving count was greater than 10, uh, we then um, put it here again to, from clause and assign a, a put, put a filter on there and only interested in people uh, that um, into events where more than 10 people left. So we can um, simply run this query here. Yeah. Um, now this is basically then how it looks. Um, you could you could also have basically we, you, there's no need really to, to nest the queries this deep. We can also just could also define views and then use the views um, and um, to basically about this deep query nest and uh, nest nesting of, of, of queries. Let's see now there's a question. No, not a question. Um, Okay, um, so um, what do we want to do next? So um, I think we can like, just continue the, uh, with the next exercise, and namely with the, um, sorry, um, namely with the um, other exercise to write data to external tables. Uh, yesterday we did this part, maintaining a continuously updated view in MySQL. Um, we can do a similar thing for uh, writing an append-only table to Kafka. Um, it basically works pretty similar to what we uh, what we did before. Again, there's like the uh, create table statement here uh, with all the properties being, uh, being, being set. And um, yeah, then you can... Um, write a query that writes to this table. And um, if you want to uh, check whether it's working or not, you can uh, run this Docker Compose command that basically uses Kafka's uh, so-called console con consumer, which reads from this topic um, that the table, that is uh, basically the topic backing the table that we defined here. And then you can see um, if the query actually wrote something into this topic or not. And of course, you can again then also check the Flink Web UI 
to see how the query uh, looks and cancel it from there. So I would uh, suggest that you're we're doing this exercise now, maybe for the next, um, yeah, seven minutes or five, five to seven minutes. So whenever you're done, just let me know. And um, after that, we can uh, talk a bit about uh, joints in uh, what what kinds of joints you can do with uh, Flink. All right, that's, uh, yes, please. Uh, this is going really fast. When I look at the Kafka consumer, that's because it's starting from the start of the topic. The table yes. that we created is basically creating a consumer that starts from the start of the topic. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> um, the, the, the table, the sprites table, um, we configured it basically you always read from the beginning of the topic so uh, actually the longer you keep the uh, demo environment open the more data is already in the topic so um, in the beginning it goes really fast and then when it basically comes to the to the end of the end of the stream or uh, then it basically starts to slow down and that's the Sick. startup mode um let me it says earliest offset. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, this in, the, in this case, it does not. This is uh, actually not really. Um, it doesn't have an influence on the uh, on the exercise that we are doing because we are writing to uh, to this uh, oh, ten yeah. minutes uh, passenger counts, right? Um, um, so that you see this, be be in this behavior because right. exactly, it's the the writes table is also defined with this. Uh, with this startup mode so for the um, yeah when you now would read from this table again um yeah then it would basically always read from the from the beginning actually this is something that we could uh, even try it. it should actually work uh, so let's say we are creating this table now um, i'm a little bit lazy so the query here is, is fairly straightforward. It's uh, we're just uh, um, doing a tumbling group by of ten minutes, and then take the uh, tumble start and the tumble end. So the first timestamp and the uh, uh, the first time that that is part of the data, and the first times uh, first timestamp that is part of the window, and the first timestamp that is not part of the window anymore, and then complete the count. And say insert into this. Uh, so and if we run this now, it's it's this job to the to the Flink cluster. Let's have a look at the dashboard. Uh, we can see this because it's still running from yesterday. So we get this query here, and uh, if we now um, do count star from 10 min passenger counts. Oh. That's Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. it's for every, for every ten minutes. So, and yeah, since it's ten uh, x for every ten minutes that, uh, for every minute that uh, we we see a new record every minute. So, if you said it's going really fast, I you know, I assume maybe you didn't stop the uh, demo environment uh, since yesterday. <laughs> um, yeah. And now, if we can, we can even now query the uh, query the table that is uh, that we are writing to with the other query that we started. Uh, 
Okay. Um, let's cancel this query. Um, then I would suggest we now continue with the um, uh, with some uh, slides on uh, joining streaming data. What time is it? Okay, we're half an hour. Um, yeah, that might be enough or might not be enough. Um, yeah, but let's see. Um, if you want to stay longer, I'm also happy to uh, to finish the, these uh, these slides, even if we go over time. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, joining tables. So um, and joining is always a bit of a uh, interesting topic uh, when it comes to streaming. In like the uh, regular SQL world, joins are fairly well understood. There's different types of joins: inner joins, outer joins. Uh, you have uh, different types of uh, predicates that you can use to to associate rates, uh, rows with each other. Uh, most uh, usually, it's equality predicates where you say some attribute in this table should be equal to the to a predicate in this table. Um, database systems have different join algorithms that they use to uh, speed up, uh, speed up joints in different situations, um, and so on. And um, in traditional SQL, this all works very well because all data is basically available when the, when a join is being processed. When you start a query with a join, uh, as I said yesterday, conceptually the system takes a snapshot of all all tables involved, and then it uh, can can perform the join. Um, Joining dynamic tables is, uh, or streams is often considered to be kind of like a challenge. Um, first of all, because these tables are constantly changing. Um, um, and um, if you want to basically join tables with a temporal condition, then these tables should be append only tables. And um, when people talk about joining between streaming data, they often have very different have different semantics in mind. Um, so usually, when you talk about streaming joins, uh, all people involved first kind of like need to get a common understanding of what they are what they're really talking about. Um, in Flink SQL, we support um, three different ways to to join dynamic tables. So tables that are changing over time. Um, the first one is called time window joins. Um, the community, the Flink community, agreed to rename this to interval joins. So if you look at the Flink do documentation uh, in one of the next releases, it, you will you probably won't find time window join anymore, but it will be called interval join. Um, there's uh, joins with uh, so-called temporal tables, and then something that we can like call regular joins, um, and that's pretty much because. The first two are working with uh, special time properties, and the other ones don't. So this is basically the uh, joins that you uh, kind of would uh, would know from, um, yeah, using using uh, SQL on regular tables. Okay, how do these joins behave? Um, so the time window join, uh, the use case for 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 this time window join is that you want to associate uh, rows of two tables uh, with each other based on uh, uh, temporal proximity. So uh, the rows should be, the, the rows that join should be uh, close to each other uh, based on some uh, time boundary. So here we have uh, two tables. We have the add, add serves table. This is like the uh, a table where where we get one record uh, whenever we uh, serve an ad to a user. So S time here is the serving time um, for, a, for a user, and then we're serving on for, for some on, on some URL. So you can think of this, yeah, as yeah, we know the user, we know uh, the URL that the user visited, and we served some ad, uh, we served an ad for this uh, for, for this link to the user memory at this point in time. And um, 
here is a clicks table, and this clicks table uh, basically has all the clicks. So whenever a user clicked on a link, we also record the time and the user. So, and um, if you would like to know, for instance, of find all the URLs that were clicked um, uh, within five seconds after they were served as an ad to the user, then this is uh, something that could be defined, you solved using this time window join. So here, if you look at it, we have this, uh, this ad here, we serve an ad to user Mary for this article uh, uh, with ID 3 at uh, 11, um, 85, 13, and there is no click for this. Uh, there is no click for this uh, article within five seconds, wait a second. You can see this, this here was clicked uh, about one minute Oh, about two minutes later after it was uh, served. So it's kind of like falls out of this five, uh, five seconds window. Whereas uh, the next uh, next URL that was uh, for uh, user Bob at ID1 was clicked here um, within two seconds after it was served to Bob. And that's why it's uh, part of the results table. So whenever you want to join uh, events from two streams, that are close to each other based on some uh, temporal boundary, then this uh, time winner join is the is what you're looking for. So here um, it's uh, defined in a um, have a more and more precise definition. So a time winner join joins records of two append only tables such that the time attributes of the joint records are not more than a specified window interval apart from each other. So, um, so here, this illustration basically says, um, here the uh, this shape here basically indicates the, uh, the the time range that this record is looking for. So um, you can you can create the range in both directions. You can say um, this record basically wants to join with everything that is uh, one hour arrived. Um, one hour earlier, uh, from from an interval from one hour earlier to fifteen minutes later, and um, you find that this join uh, the other record uh, range is exactly the other way around. So this record here would join with everything that arrived fifteen minutes earlier up to one hour later. And for instance, here you can see that uh, these two records here basically. Uh, meet each other because this one arrived less than one hour earlier than this one here, and those two records here would then match and produce a join result. Whereas this one here doesn't see anything uh, in its uh, range, and hence it's not shown. Um, the syntax for this um, is also just standard SQL syntax. However, um, again, um, the you kind of like need to specify, write the join in a certain way, uh, with a, or give give a appropriate uh, join condition such that Flink will understand this um, this uh, these these intervals and ranges. So um, if you specify a query like this, um, A and B should be tables that are um, append only, so they only receive new records. Or never update any records, then there needs to be some kind of equality predicate. So here we join on some uh, some ID, and then there is uh, a predicate that defines a closed window um, around the time attributes of A and B. So the easiest way to specify this is if you have uh, like E, T, and uh, A, T, and A, uh, and B, T are the time attributes of A and B. So you can specify uh, the, the time attribute of A should be between the time attribute of T minus some time and B uh, and BT plus some interval. And this way um, you um, uh, form a closed uh, closed range between these two uh, closed range. 
uh, because you're specifying um, a lower bound and an upper bound uh, that A has to has to match against. You could also specify A T equals B T, but then the timestamps need to be exactly the same. And uh, if you don't say that A T equals B T, then you have to specify like an upper, uh, a lower bound and an upper bound. And you can either do this with a between predicate or with a two, uh, two, two range predicates where A T uh, larger B T minus this and A T smaller than B T this. But the important thing is that, like as I said, the, the range that you're defining needs to be uh, needs to be closed. So if we want to um, uh, solve the task that we had here before, then uh, the query would look like this. We would have uh, the uh, clicks table and the serves table. Um, we would join on the URL because we're interested um, on the URL and the user here um, because we're interested all, only on events where the URL matches and the user matches. Uh, and then we would specify that the click time should be between the serving time and the serving time plus an interval of five seconds. So here we don't subtract it, but it's um, the lower bound here is basically the serving time. It's uh, not really possible that the user clicks before the ad was served, but from the time when the ad was served to five seconds after that, um, we want to uh, basically join if a click happened within this time. Oh, okay, there's a little bit more. So uh, in terms of execution, if you're curious like how this uh, executes, um, what the operator that performs this join in turn does, it basically keeps uh, the, 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 the tail of both streams in state, and but only the, this, uh, this part of the, of the, of the tail that is needed to answer the join. And once the time progresses such that the rows uh, fall out of the, uh, the, the join range, they're removed from state. And uh, therefore, um, the, the large, basically, the larger the time interval gets that you're specifying, the more uh, state uh, is held by the, by the query operator. Um, Something that can always happen in, uh, in, in, in event time processing is that if both tables have kind of like a different, different timing um, on there's uh, some, some, some skew between the data of both tables, in that case, um, um, kind of the join operates at the, at the speed of the slowest table. Um, and this means that more data for the, for the other table, for the faster table needs to be buffered. Um, yeah, joins with uh, temporal tables. So the use case here is um, that we um, kind of like have, again, two tables. We have a, have a clicks table here that we had before, and then some kind of user history table where we uh, basically, um, this is a table that stores uh, different versions, or basically stores the history of a of, of a user, and whenever a user changes uh, um, the subscription, then a new record is added to this uh, user's table history table. Uh, this history table is uh, therefore like append only, so we don't. It's not modeled that there is uh, that the user ID is a unique key uh, is is a primary key, and we simply update the field. But instead, uh, it's modeled in a way that we keep. Uh, all different versions. If whenever something changes, we just append a new record with a uh, with a new version time. So, um, and if now we uh, have a have this uh, clicks table here um, and the user history table here, uh, what we basically want to do is um, we want to join each uh, click here uh, with the current subscription status of the user. So, if we get this record here for Mary. Uh, at 12 o'clock, uh, we basically want to conceptually do a lookup in the in the users table here and join it with the latest value uh, for Mary at this time. So latest value here for Mary is 
um, is the version at uh, 10 o'clock. Um, and therefore, we join the subscription for, for this record. Uh, at a later point in time, at 15 o'clock, um, there's another click uh, of the user Mary. Uh, this time, we have to look uh, up the current version for uh, for uh, 3 o'clock. And um, in the meantime, Mary had changed her subscription status um, to paid. And hence, we need to join the paid state here. So there is a, something that is um, important here that one usually doesn't really uh, sees on the first side. And this is uh, this temporal relationship between the click time here, uh, bet between the timestamp um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the version time. The important thing is if we would model this query basically as a simple join without a temporal, con temporal condition, uh, but have instead a, a table here where we would, uh, where the user would be um, like a primary key and we would simply update the field here. Um, as soon as we would do an update here and we specify the query we want to uh, evaluate it with uh, regular SQL semantics, as soon as we would change um, the subscription of a user, we would need to update all result rows that we ever processed for this user as, as well. Because um, if this is treated as a, as, as a table that is um, that, that can change its records at any point in time, we also need to be able to update the result. And um, this also means that we would need to store the full clicks table to be able to update the result. So um, if you want to avoid that, we kind of somehow need to encode this uh, this uh, temporary relationship into the join that we always want to join this record with the uh, most recent version um, that was uh, available before this, uh, this timestamp. So um, here the uh, definition is um, a temporal table gives access to the history of a dynamic table. Um, by joining with the temporal table records of an append, only table can be joined with a version of the dynamic table that corresponds to that timestamp. So if we have this, if this is the append only table here, this is the clicks table in our previous example, and this is the user history table, then if we have a record at this point in time, it would join with the record at this time. If we have a record here, it would join with a, not with this because there's a new version here, so it would join with this, it would also join with this, this would also join with this here, then we get an update, uh, but there's no record on this, uh, on the append only table. The next record here on the append only table and then gets again the latest version. So we always uh, associating each record on the append only table with the most recent version in the temporal table. Um, this Kind of like needs uh, means we have um, the the the, the temporal table is defined um, kind of as a as a parameterized or, or as, as a parameterized view um, on this history table. Um, that basically means that we can um, query the history table for certain points in time. So if we have uh, this history table here. And it also needs to have a have a have a unique have have a have a unique key field. Um, if we have this history table here, and uh, we want to get the most recent version at uh, twelve or uh, twelve o three, then um, the values that would correspond to the most recent ver version here are are these. So we would get the B value. It's uh, from uh, twelve o'clock. The A value is from uh, 12, uh, 12.01, and the C value would from uh, 12.03. If you would later go ahead and uh, ask the same question at, uh, for, for the time 12.06, we get different values. So we get a, well, okay, for C it's the same value because nothing was changed in the meantime. But uh, A was changed, B was changed, and there is even a new record for, uh, for, for, for D at this time. Um, 
In Flink SQL, we, we model these uh, temporal tables as a um, table valued function that kind of like needs to be defined on the on the history table. Um, so, and this uh, and this is basically what we also did in the in the exercise with this uh, driver driver changes table. The driver changes table uh, is the history table, and um, on this we defined this. Uh, um, built a function that can be used to access different fields. I think that's probably all a little bit abstract, but uh, let's have a look at how this uh, how this uh, is uh, looks looks in in SQL. So we have this table A, which is this append only table, and then um, we join this. Uh, this is the standard SQL syntax for using it, uh, a table table valued function. So it's a lateral table, and we pass in the uh, time attribute of A as a parameter. And this basically means that we want to get the value of this function here at time um, at the time for of, of, of the current record. So for every record, you can you can think of it as uh, as follows: um, for every record of A, we basically do a lookup. In the in this in this table function in the temporal table, and we, uh, for for the lookup we need the timestamp because we want to get the most recent version with respect to this timestamp, and then we do an uh, equality predicate uh, we do an uh, uh, equality join uh, predicate um, here on the um, on the unique key of B. So it's basically modeled as a simple lookup. Uh, against the temporal table um, based on the time. So for uh, the uh, exercise that we did for, for the example that we did before, we would have this clicks table C. We would have a uh, and join with the lateral table here with this function users. Users is a function that is defined on the user history. We uh, provide the click time and the, 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 the click time of the of each click record. And then we join on um, the user of the click with the uh, ID of these user subscriptions table. Um, for the execution, this is um, um, what what basically happens is internally is that the uh, um, for this uh, temporal table, for this uh, users table, uh, where we kind of need to be able to look up different versions, um, we uh, need to keep a few records in state, namely uh, for each for each unique value of the lateral table, we keep the most recent version in uh, in, in in state, and um, for the clicks table, we don't need to. Uh, we don't uh, store any any uh, any of these records in in state. We don't need to materialize them because um, the uh, we we know that we can for every of these uh, for every row from the clicks table we can simply do the lookup. And uh, since we have this this uh, this uh, temporal condition um, that we always want to get the most recent version, we can simply do the lookup, join the uh, a result together and emit the result. So we don't need to hold any of uh, any record of C in state, but only the most recent version of the of the of this of this temporal table. And um, yeah, that's maybe. Yeah, this is always a bit uh, tricky to explain. I hope it uh, uh, made sense uh, to some extent. Um, we have some exercises also for that in the uh, in the um, um, in the in the in the week in the repository. So you can uh, use that and to to play around with this uh, concept of temporal uh, joining of temporal tables. Okay, now let me uh, briefly go over the like 
regular join, which is actually the join that you kind of know from, uh, should know from SQL already. Um, here we are, um, have again two tables that we want to join. One is this uh, clicks table with click events. And the other one is, um, is it, oh, I see it's a little bit messed up here. Um, oh, no, it looks better. Um, so one is the uh, clicks table and the other one is a, is a users table. Um, so here we modeled, um, modeled this exactly as I said before with a table that is just updated. Um, and there is no, uh, we don't track any version. So uh, let's say we have um, the clicks, this is the clicks table at, uh, at 12 o'clock, and this is the user's table at 12 o'clock. If we join them together with a just regular join, then we would have uh, Mary, we would uh, count the number of clicks, um, and we join it with uh, the current subscription. Same for bot, and uh, everything's uh, fine at 12 o'clock. If uh, now the user's table changes at, uh, at one o'clock, we need to update the result that we computed before. So at, sorry, at uh, one o'clock, Mary changes her subscription to paid. So this means we now kind of need to update the result that we produced before because it's not valid anymore. So uh, the subscription here changes from free to paid. And if now uh, the clicks table changes at 14, uh, at, at 2 o'clock, and we get another record for Mary, then we need to again update this result because we also want to like count the uh, number of clicks. And now the, uh, the count uh, increases from uh, 2, from 1 to 2. So you see, um, at any point in time when something changes in either of, the, of both tables, we need to update the result. And uh, in order to be able to do that, um, we need to keep uh, both tables completely um, in state because uh, anything can happen at any point in time. We always need to be able to update the result. There's no temporal boundary uh, for, for, for the computation that would say, uh, at this point in time, you can be sure that uh, the result will never change. This is not there, so um, we need to keep uh, all data from both tables um, in state. Um, the syntax for this looks uh, just as any join in, in, in SQL, right? You have um, tables A and B, and you just give the uh, join condition in the, in the where clause uh, you can also specify them with the like, with a with uh, join clause. So A joins B on uh, A uh, I, A ID equals B ID. So both of both join syntaxes are supported. Um, yeah, but since A and B are both completely held into memory, um, it's kind of like um, advisable um, that both input tables are not uh, append only and growing very fast because you just need to buffer all of the data unless you specify this idle state retention and then you might uh, get inconsistent results. So the use case for uh, the query that would implement this here uh, would, would, would be this. We have, um, the clicks table, we group on the user account per user, and then join this result with the users table on the ID user field. And um, this way we can, uh, the, the, the system translates this into a query where uh, we first basically do the aggregation here on the clicks table. So we have for every, u we have a, uh, for every user, we uh, keep the current uh, count of clicks. And for every user, we also have we also have the users table on the other side. Both are kind of like updating tables that are updated per user, and hence not uh, growing very large. Uh, when a new click is added, um, it doesn't add a new row unless it's a user, new user. But if it's a user that was already there, we just have to update the count, but not add a new row to this 
uh, table. And both of these tables are the result of this query and the um, users table are held completely in the state of the join operator. Um, yeah, so uh, I think I've already said this before as well. So regular joins can forward time attributes um, because they um, any record can join with any other record at any point in time. So the order of outputs is uh, of the emitted um, rows is uh, pretty much random. So they um, cannot uh, the, the watermark alignment basically is uh, is then lost. All right, so we have some exercises for for for, for joining these dynamic tables. Um, I think the tutorial time is over. If you want to um, spend some time looking into these exercises, uh, uh, feel free to do so. I'm happy to hang around for a couple more minutes if there's any questions. Um, if not, um, all of the exercises are here in the wiki. You can just uh, play around that. There is another uh, topic about these uh, match recognize clauses. Uh, all of the slides that are shown are always linked in the uh, in each of the pages here. So if you click, for instance, here on the uh, pattern matching with match recognize, click on this link here. There is the uh, uh, PDF for this slide set. You can just study it yourself and also do the exercises. Um, Okay, so I'd say uh, this is it. Um, I hope um, you had fun, learned something. Um, yeah, if you wanna wanna do the uh, join exercises, feel free to, as I said, uh, have a look at that. If not, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and the other talks. Um, and yeah, if there's any any issues, any questions, uh, the Flink uh, user mailing list is very, very friendly and uh, answers a lot of questions. Uh, we're also quite active on Stack Overflow. Uh, or, yeah, feel free to open an issue on the, on the um, training repository. Yeah, whatever works best for you. Thank you.